Good morning, everybody. Here we are to discuss again worship. Here I am to worship. What do we mean when we say that? We've discussed a number of things in our classes so far. We've talked about the word minka, which means to bring a gift, to bring something to the Lord. Um, we've talked about uh, the word ola, which means to send something up to the Lord. Uh, last week we talked about um, the word which means uh, to draw near, to come near, karav, and nagash, these words which means to make a journey in your spirit, to come into the presence of God, to intentionally have a meeting with God. All of that is involved in worship. So we're glad you're here today and we're going to talk about some other very important aspects of worship for people who want to be true worshipers. I want to be a true worshiper, don't you? I want to really worship God the way God uh, calls me to worship Him. Uh, we also, I remember, had the word kara, which means to call out to God. So worship is me or you calling out to our God individually on purpose at a particular time. Today we're going to begin with another concept and that is the idea that worship means to fear the Lord. There is a word yire in the Bible, yire, which means to fear. And it means to reverence, but it really does mean fear. I've heard a lot of discussions where people try to uh, eradicate the concept of fear uh, from this word worship, but you really can't do that if you read the whole Bible, if you read the Old Testament especially. Um, in uh, the book of Deuteronomy, uh, chapter 6 and verse 13, it says, Fear the Lord your God and serve, your, serve him only and take your oaths in his name. Now, this word is, is yireh, fear the Lord your God. Now, in Matthew 4, verse 10, Jesus actually quoted this passage of Scripture. And in the New Testament, the, the Greek New Testament says, Worship the Lord your God, and him only shall you serve. But that word worship in the Old Testament, in the original language, is the word to fear. So what is worship? It is to fear, to show fear. Not just to show it, but to feel it in the presence of God. Consider these passages of Scripture when we think about this idea. In Genesis 31, verse 42... God is actually called the God of Abraham and the fear of Isaac. The fear of Isaac. In other words, the one whom Isaac feared. Do you fear God? Do you? Exodus 19, 16. Remember when God came down upon the mountain at Mount Sinai. And the Bible says that everyone in the camp trembled. You know, we, we sing a song that talks about trembling at his voice. Trembling. That's, that's fear that runs all the way down into our stomach to tremble at his voice. Is, is that something that you understand toward God? In Ezekiel, in Ecclesiastes, pardon me, chapter 12 and verse 13, the Bible says, This is the end of the matter. All has been heard. Fear God and keep his commandments for this is the whole duty of man <clears throat> you know in the book of ecclesiastes solomon is musing about all the things that he he searched in to find the meaning of life and at the end of the book he hasn't found the meaning of the life in pleasure or in study or in building things or any of those other things he said i discovered that this is the only thing that means anything and that is to fear god and keep his commandments. Do you fear God and keep his commandments? Um, in Psalm 36, verse 1, it's talking about the wicked, the people that don't care about God, that don't serve God. And this is also quoted by Paul in Romans chapter 3, verse 18. And it says of those people, there is no fear of God before their eyes. There's no fear of God. 
before their eyes. How can we worship God unless we have a sense of fear and awe and reverence before God? Now remember, worship is many different things. Worship is calling out to God. Worship is bringing a gift to God. You know, worship is, is uh, uh, drawing near to God. It's lots of different things. But one of the things worship is, is fearing God. Uh, the thief on the cross, you know, when he was being crucified there in Luke chapter 23 and, and that, that other thief was, was railing on Jesus and insulting Jesus, the thief said, do you not even fear God? Seeing that our punishment is just, we're receiving what, what we're supposed to receive, don't you fear God? Well, the wicked have no fear of God before their eyes. So, when you come before the Lord, do you fear God? There is an emotion there. There is a, there is a tremendous awe. There is a, a realization in the mind of worshipers that, that God is all-powerful and that God is our judge and that God is the one that holds our future and our eternity, our reward or punishment in his hand. And we should give him the fear that is due him. That doesn't mean we can't have a good relationship with him, but we should have a healthy fear of God along with our love for God. In Matthew chapter 4, there's a related concept right before we Jesus quotes the passage about fearing God. In Matthew 4.10, a little bit earlier there, it talks about Satan. Satan says, if you will bow down and worship me, you know, I'll give you all this. Well, <clears throat> the word bow down is also another concept that we want to talk about relative to worship, which is related to this idea of fear. If, if you think of being so in awe or fear of someone that you just bow down to the ground in their presence. See, this is, this is a humbling of the self. Uh, it's, it's a lesser realizing that he or she is coming into the presence of a greater, a far greater. It's the powerless coming into the presence of the powerful. It's the vulnerable coming into the presence of the powerful. The Hebrew word shaka means to bow down, to prostrate oneself uh, before the, uh, a superior. So to fear the Lord and to bow down before the Lord is uh, a concept that's very much related. We sing a song, Come let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord our God, our Maker. For He is our God. Well, that should be the, the attitude we have in our heart or our spirit. When we come before the Lord, <clears throat> we sing the old song, Lord, we come before Thee now. At Thy feet we humbly bow. And see, there are different bows, even in Asian culture, where there's a little bow like this, and there's a little bit deeper bow, and then there's the bow where you just go over sideways or on your knees. That's the, the deepest bow. And I think what we need in, in front of the Lord is in our spirit, in our mind, in our heart, we need that deepest, low down to the ground bow where we're totally submissive, totally humble totally vulnerable <clears throat> in the presence of God. In Psalm 95, this is the psalm from which our song comes, verse 6, O oh, come, let us worship and bow down, let us kneel before the Lord our God, our Maker. We've talked before about how when you get on your knees, when you bow down, it puts you into a different attitude even for prayer. Let us kneel before the Lord our God, our Maker, for He is our God. And we are the people of his pasture and the sheep of his hand. So what is worship? Worship is to fear the Lord. Worship is to bow down to the Lord. And yes, sometimes worship is to praise the Lord and to rejoice in the presence of the Lord. It is all those things. But one of the aspects of worship that we need to feel and experience and, and encourage in ourselves is to bow down and to fear the Lord. Connected with this idea of fear <clears throat> is the idea of God being a jealous God. 
in um, the Ten Commandments, you know, where it says, do not take the name of the Lord in vain, meaning don't take an oath in God's name and not keep your word. And uh, it also says uh, in the Ten Commandments, um, I think this is the where it says, don't, don't uh, have any other gods before me. Uh, you don't make in, any graven images. You don't bow down to them or serve them. For I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God. The word jealous is the Hebrew word kana, which means to turn red or to turn dark with anger or jealousy. You see, God can get angry. And when God gets angry, people should be afraid. And there's a great deal in the Bible about the anger, the wrath of God. The jealousy of God makes him turn red. It makes him turn dark uh, with anger. <clears throat> and so in the Ten Commandments in Exodus chapter 20, it says, don't serve or worship or fear or bow down to any other God because I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God. He turns dark red with anger. Similarly, in Deuteronomy 12, verse 30 to 32, beware that you are not ensnared to follow them after they are destroyed before you and that you do not inquire after their gods, saying, how do these nations serve their gods that I may do likewise? Why does Moses preach to them and say, beware, because God is a jealous God and we should be afraid if we make him jealous. You shall not behave this way toward the Lord your God, Deuteronomy 12:31. For every abominable act which the Lord hates, they have done for their gods. They even burn their sons and daughters in the fire. And then God reiterates, whatever I command you, you shall be careful to do. You shall not add to it nor take away from it. So to fear the Lord, <clears throat> to, <clears throat> to realize that we should bow down before the Lord, to, to realize that we should never make the Lord jealous by giving our allegiance or our praise or our worship or our trust to anything else but Him. This is part of the, the right mindset, the right attitude of someone who worships the Lord. Are you a true worshiper? Do you fear the Lord? Do you bow down to the Lord? Do you respect and reverence Him knowing that He's a jealous God and wants your devotion and not to share that with anyone else? important for true worshipers of God. Now we're going to enter into uh, a phase of our class where we're going to explore a new area. And this is a very vital and deeply theological area of worship. And it is what I like to call blood worship. Um, <clears throat> the first idea that we want to look at in this idea of blood worship is the idea of uh, uh, an altar. Uh, the word altar is bamizbah, bamizbah, and it means a slaughtering place, a killing place. And uh, the verb as associated with it is zabah, and that means to kill or slaughter something. And so, in the history of God's people, there was much killing of animals, and finally, there was a killing of Jesus Christ and there was much blood shed. So let's talk about this for just a, mo a moment. Worship involved killing uh, in the Old Testament and it involves a sacrifice in the New Testament as well. As you see this sheep laying on this altar and the Israelite altar was to be made from un uncut stones out of the fields with just earth holding it together. The Canaanites, the, the pagan peoples, they uh, used cut, ornate, carved, beautiful stones for their altars. But God said, uh, just use uncut stones and earth. And they would kill the animal and they would uh, put the blood of the animal on the altar. And in um, the book of Leviticus, the first several chapters of Leviticus are all about different killings, different sacrifices for different purposes and what the person was to do and how the person was to slaughter the animal and butcher the animal in, in every case. Now, even before the law of Moses, 
when you go back into the book of Genesis, <clears throat> in Genesis 12, 8, and Genesis 13, and Genesis 21, as we studied earlier, remember we talked about the, the idea that worship was calling on the name of the Lord, calling out to God. But part of that calling out to God to come into the presence of God involved killing something. So Abraham uh, would, would build an altar, a mizbah, a, a slaughtering place. And there, with the killing of a sacrifice, he would call upon the name of the Lord. Um, Abraham, in his experience, did this often. And um, he did it at a particular time, at a particular place, from time to time. He would build one of these altars, and he would kill something. And in Genesis 22, uh, the pinnacle of this in Abraham's life was when God commanded uh, Abraham to take his son, his only son, Isaac, to Mount Moriah and kill him there, sacrifice him there uh, on an altar as an offering to the Lord. Now, this is a fascinating subject for many different reasons, uh, one of which is that Mount Moriah ended up being the place where God chose in the land of Canaan uh, to build the temple. It ended up being a part of Jerusalem and, and uh, a place where God chose to build the temple where the people of Israel for centuries and centuries uh, killed their sacrifices on the altar. But it was at this place in Genesis 22 that God told Abraham to kill his son. And of course, you know the story of how he took his son and he bound him and laid him on the altar and he took the knife and he was about to plunge it in him, in his son, believing that if God needed to, he would raise Isaac from the dead. And the angel of the Lord told him to stay his hand. And in Genesis chapter 22, verses 12 and 13, we read the story of how there was a ram, a male sheep, caught in the bushes and uh, he was able to substitute that ram for his son and kill that that ram at that place and and uh, he worshiped God successfully by that substitutional sacrifice here you have the idea in blood worship that the animal being killed is a substitute you know the bible says that the wages of sin is death and um I deserve death. You deserve death. It's my blood that deserves to be shed. It's your blood that deserves to be shed. But this, this animal that was sacrificed back in the Old Testament was seen as a substitute. So very much related to this idea that was so involved in blood worship of a slaughtering place, a killing place, where the blood of a living thing was, was shed, is... The next word we're going to study, kifer, K-I-P-H-E-R, kifer. And this word means to cover over. We translate it a lot of times to make atonement. But literally it means to cover over or to hide or to expiate, to ransom, to pacify the anger of God, to propitiate God's anger. So how do you cover up? for the offensive sins of man in the presence of God. How do you make atonement? Uh, some of you may remember the Ark of the Covenant. The top of the Ark of the Covenant was called the mercy seat. And some of your uh, translations translate it the atonement cover because you have this Hebrew word used there. Uh, in Leviticus 16, there was a day of atonement. And that's when the sacrifices were brought for the entire uh, nation of Israel. Uh, the temple and the tabernacle were places where people daily brought their sheep and their cattle and they brought them to the altar of God and they were slaughtered there and the blood was poured on the corners of the altar and the animals were offered up to God. Now, there are some very um, compelling an emotional type theology related to this because if you if you look at the um, the book of Leviticus particularly where these sacrifices are described and if you'll look at Leviticus chapter 4 as an example uh, in Leviticus chapter 4 and verse uh, 33 it's talking about uh, if a member of the community sins 
Let's start at 32. <clears throat> it says, If he brings a lamb as his sin offering, he is to bring a female without defect. He is to lay his hand on its head and slaughter it for a sin offering at the place where the burnt offering is slaughtered. So they would bring their sacrifice and they would literally bring a live animal and they would put their hands on the head of this animal and with their hands on the head of this animal they or the priest would slit the throat of this animal and under their hands touching the animal the animal would literally quiver and die and the blood of this animal spill out on the ground and and it was it was a rather close up and personal experience uh, to to kill this animal and to be there at its execution and to <clears throat> be a part of the collecting of the blood of this animal which is now dead no longer alive because of my sin and to see the blood poured out upon the altar and the animal butchered and it was it was personal it was not something that could be kept at arm's length in fact if you if you read through Leviticus 4 and 5 and and the other chapters around you'll see this phrase used often in the bringing of sacrifices he shall lay his hand upon his its head so when you bring the sacrifice you put your hands on the head and then of course it talks about the the killing of the animal whether it was a sheep or a goat or a bull or whatever and in Leviticus 4 verse 35 at the end of that verse it says in this way the priest will make atonement for him for the sin he has committed and he will be forgiven and there with the with the slaughtered animal see the priest is making atonement with the blood of that animal he's able to cover up or hide or expiate or propitiate or satisfy the anger of God and the sins of that person can be covered up but at what cost at what cost well through the life of a person at different times how many animals would be killed because of my sin because of your sin in, in fact there was an endless stream of people and there was an endless line of animals that died and died and died and died and died and died some more and more and more blood was spilled uh, for the sins of people in Leviticus 17 verse 11 there's a very very important passage about blood worship atonement worship it says for the life of the flesh is in the blood and I have given it to you up on the altar remember the altar is the killing place I have given it, that is the blood, to you on the altar to make atonement, to cover up, to expiate, to satisfy for your souls. For it is the blood by reason of the life that makes atonement. Remember that the wages of sin is death and it is life given that makes atonement for what I owe and what you owe to God. And of course... On the Day of Atonement, as we studied last time, um, the people would gather around the tabernacle, as you see in the diagram of the, of the camp, and in that courtyard, in the front of that courtyard, that little square is the, is the altar, and they would gather around there, and they would bring their sacrifice, and the priest would make these sacrifices for the nations, and the high priest would sacrifice one for himself, and then he would sacrifice an animal for the nation and he would go in then into the holy of holies and he would take a bowl of that blood and he would sprinkle it seven times in the presence of the Lord on that atonement cover and he would ask the forgiveness of himself and of the sins of the people and they were people were accepted by God the priest was accepted by God they were uh, approved by God because of the atonement that was made, the acknowledgement of sin, the acknowledgement of the cost of that sin, the acknowledgement that we owe you our life and yet your grace has allowed us to substitute this other sacrifice. Now today, there is still blood worship and we're going to talk about this at more length next time. But in Hebrews 4 verse 16, speaking about that day of atonement when the high priest would go <clears throat> in front of the ark of God 
which was a replica of the throne of God. It was called the mercy seat or the throne of grace. And so Hebrews 4 says to us, therefore, let us draw near. And it's talking about we Christians who don't go through a physical tabernacle with a physical Ark of the Covenant, but spiritually we approach the very throne of God in heaven with the help of Jesus Christ. And it says, let us draw near with confidence to the throne of grace. But see, you don't come before the throne of grace. You don't come before the mercy seat without blood. And of course, we have the blood of Christ to come before that. Why do we draw near, as we talked about last week, to the throne of grace? So that we may receive mercy. See, God freely forgives us of our sins when we draw near with the blood of Christ. And we find grace to help us in time of need. God is, is receptive to us. He's approving to us when we come to him uh, with atonement worship. Now, uh, the, the last part of our discussion today is going to move us into our discussion next time because in Hebrews chapter 13, verse 13, there's a fascinating passage that parallels the experience of Christians with the experience of these people who offered these blood sacrifices in the Old Testament. It says, we have an altar from which those who serve the tabernacle have no right to eat. Now, the we here is Christians. We have an altar. Now, what is an altar? Remember, an altar is a killing place. An altar is a slaughtering place. So, preacher, what does he mean when he says we have an altar? Well, let's read it. We have an altar from which those who serve the tabernacle, those Jewish priests, have no right to eat. For the bodies of those animals whose blood is brought to the holy place by the high priest as an offering for sin are burned outside the camp. Therefore Jesus also, that he might sanctify the people through his own blood, suffered outside the gate. So then let us go to him outside of the gate. Jesus is our sacrifice. But what I want you to see in Hebrews <clears throat> chapter 13, verse 10, and this is very subtle, is that he's talking about eating from the altar. See, in the Old Testament sacrifices, people killed a sacrifice. And then in many of those sacrifices, they ate part of the animal that was butchered while the other part of the animal was burned on the altar to God. So not only did they bring a sacrifice, but they ate a meal to show their, their wholeness and their, their fellowship with God. We're going to talk about that in relation to this more next time. But in Hebrews chapter 10, comparing those sacrifices of the blood worship of the Old Testament, verse 4 the writer says, It is really impossible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sin. Therefore, <clears throat> when he comes into the world, talking about Jesus, he says, Sacrifice and offering you have not desired, but a body you prepared for me. In whole burnt offerings and sacrifices for sin you have no pleasure. Then I said, Behold, I have come to do your will, O God. And so God prepared a body for Jesus so that he could be our sacrifice. And then in verse 8 of that same chapter, he says, After saying above sacrifices and offerings and whole burnt offerings and sacrifices for sins, you have not desired nor have you taken pleasure in them which are offered according to the law. And then he said, Behold, I have come to do your will. He takes away the first, that is those first animal sacrifices, and established the second sacrifice. And by this will we have been sanctified through the offering of the body of Christ once for all. The body of Christ is my blood sacrifice to God. The blood of Jesus Christ is my atonement, that which covers up or hides or expiates my sin. And when I eat the Lord's Supper, I am eating from the sacrificial altar as an act of fellowship with God because God accepts me because of that fellowship. So next time we're going to talk about atonement worship, blood worship, 
in the modern time in talking about the Lord's Supper. I hope you'll be with us. Remember that worship is fearing the Lord. Worship is bowing down in total humility before the Lord. And worship involves blood worship or atonement and approaching the Lord through sacrifice. I hope you have a wonderful week. God bless. Worship. Here I am to bow down. Here I am to say.